that whole uh, Morena mm-hmm. becoming a, a scandal of women begging their gynecologist yeah. to have it removed and they don't want yeah. them. Oh, it's yeah. fine, it's fine, it's no issue, no issue. Meanwhile, yeah. that, you know, they're, yeah. they're being hospitalized with mental conditions. And yeah, just, absolutely. And that's not new at all. Like the, the thing is, is when you look at birth control, um, so birth control being oral, I'm talking, when I say birth control, I mean oral contraceptive agents. Um, so even though estrogen was synthesized um, for pharmaceutical use in the late 1920s, so about 1928, progesterone wasn't until, it was 1933, but not really until 1950s. Um, and then all of a sudden the birth control pill came out in 1960, 1961. It was released to market. Um, and that actually birth, the, the re- controlling fertility in women it's one of the whole reasons why we have endocrinology today. It was kind of this conquest for women not to get pregnant, which is steered into this endocrinology kind of universe. So when birth control came out, there wasn't a lot of clinical trials done. Um, this is in the 1960s. There still isn't a lot of clinical trials done. New drugs are getting produced all the time. Birth control has gone from being a uh, reproductive control agent to a lifestyle drug it is now prescribed for anything from acne to pms or premenstrual syndrome which that in itself is uh i mean it's another rabbit hole i can go down with you guys but it's there's a lot of problems with that idea um it can be prescribed for just i mean convenience sake because it's perceived that menstruation is a nuisance it's annoying and that there are so many other co-variables that are causing women to have really shitty menstrual cycles so they feel that's their only option um, when there are other ways to help somebody have a healthy normal menstrual cycle um, and that morena when it came out so i mean it's an iud so an intrauterine device um, it's a hormonal though intrauterine device there's other hormonal intrauterine devices but specifically the morena uses a progesterone and so i guess to maybe back up a little bit birth control does not use a synthetic progesterone it uses a synthetic progesterone so there's a different spelling it's a different molecule it is either going to be derived from progesterone or derived from testosterone. These are bastardized molecules. Our body really doesn't know what to do with them um, because it's not natural to our body. If it was, we would call it progesterone, um, but it's not. So number one thing to remember is that like birth control is not hormone replacement. It's adding a new drug into our body. Something mm-hmm. like the Morena is adding a high amount of a molecule that like intravaginally to a localized reproductive organ and thinking that that's okay it's amazing that the focus was always on let's find a way to make to ensure that women don't get pregnant let's, mm-hmm. let's not work on you know let's not focus on us yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna get to give the stuff to the women yeah always- there's an um, there's an amazing book so she's actually one of my favorite medical uh historians that is a medical anthropologist all of her work is in kind of like our ideas around hormones, but she actually did a book on the male birth control. And where is, where, where did we lose track of this idea? And I mean, it goes back to just these really archaic ideas that women are the the baby makers and therefore we need to control their reproduction. Um, And it has created so many myths around the female body. It's created so many myths around the menstrual cycle and so many myths around contraception. I mean, the fact that today we have kind of this weird juxtaposition now, even in the world of endocrinology between oral contraceptive use and IUDs and people thinking that they are totally different entities, which of course they have different drug route administration. Wouldn't call that the same. Deeper Provera, it's a shot for women. It's also not the same uh, route of an admin, but they're all doing something in our bodies, which is to stop us from ovulating through the use of exogenous steroids. But I mean, crap, you don't hear birth control being called a steroid. No. When I tell people I'm a women's health researcher studying steroids, they're like, oh, so androgen use? I'm like, well, yes, but actually my dissertation is on the use of oral contraceptive agents. Um, so it's really the only meaning that the general public knows. Steroids. Absolutely. And that's sport. We can, like, we can thank sport for that one. Um, absolutely thanks sport for that one. So with the Morena though, 
there's a lot of lawsuits. The lawsuits actually, they started around like 2000, I believe 11, 2013. There was more people going public. Um, there was a couple of times in 2016, 2018 that they went into court. Now there's even more. So this has been an ongoing basis, but they were still readily giving it to consumers without telling them that there's these ongoing lawsuits. This is the same for Diane 35, which is a oral contraceptive pill. Uh, Yasmin. Yaz also, they even rebranded, rechanged the name. So there are numerous forms of contraceptive agents that go through these shifts. And they're not the only drugs out there, to be honest, that have these issues. There are numerous drugs that have, um, that go to market, consumer use, and then they get pulled back. Now with birth control though, there has been a lot more twists and turns with that. Um, I mean, the history of birth control, if anybody's interested, it is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. Um, where funding came from and how certain products got made and why certain products stay on and should may not stay on. It's, it's insane. But I guess the, the point here is that for women that feel that there is something wrong and they have maybe a Mirena or a Skylar or any of the other intrauterine IUDs, go to a different doctor. I just beg you go to a different doctor. If your doctor is not, um, one of my little tips is just to ask them to record that they are not going to take it out or that they're refusing say hey can you chart that then and they either will often change their mind pretty quickly or you can ask to be referred to a different doctor and at least in canada that is that's pretty much it can't say it is a right because it eh, that's a gray area but it, it we have a right to health care in canada so i know around the world it might be a little bit different but I beg you, if you feel that there is something wrong, even if there isn't, make sure. Gotcha. I did have one question. We were talking mm -hmm. extensively about estrogen. Um, the general consensus with some of the guys in the group of what everyone was kind of taught mm -hmm. is that the cardiovascular systems of men do not differ from women all that much. It's, you know, our bones mm -hmm. are more or less the same. Our cardiovascular mm -hmm. systems are more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Heart and everything else. Mm -hmm. is having all these wonderful benefits on women mm -hmm. should technically have the same benefits on men mm -hmm. though men are technically are, are often wanting to block it saying that there's mm -hmm. a, a ceiling that we shouldn't surpass yeah. and if we do all these yeah. things. what are your thoughts on that yeah so i think it goes back to what i said at the beginning um there's intra individuality and inter and that Optimal is not a binary. It's not one or the other. It's a bell curve. And so if you think about taking like a bell curve, a U upside down, it's not found on either end. It's found in the middle. And in that middle, that U, there's a lot of variability. It's a continuum. So I think when we think about something like estrogen, we have to think about our levels of testosterone. So if you have super physiological levels of testosterone and your estrogen is maybe higher than say a lab norm, that might make sense for that individual based on the fact that they have super physiological androgen levels. Um, I mean, if somebody has really, really low estrogen um, because they've been blocking it, there are implications for that. I mean, I, I always laugh because with my background, like I kind of, I was in the bodybuilding world for a bit and, but not kind of loosely and now fix a lot of people, but there's so many people that think something like say ED um, is related to, too high androgenic compounds and then they're knocking every ounce of estrogen out of their body with like three different types of AIs. Right. And I just go like, no, it, there's a balance. Our body is a beautifully intricate, beautifully intricate vessel. And we don't know everything. We will never know everything. If you look go outside on a clear night and you look up in the sky it, our body's no different. We know very little about a lot. And so to think that something like there are absolute guidelines for, say, depleting a male's estrogen, I have to question that. Now, is there a range that might be better suited for an individual? Absolutely. But that's going to be a bit of learning and understanding. And I would suggest, though, somebody who maybe has these questions to think about those variables I mentioned earlier. Because those variables, as, as I was talking about them, more or less related to androgens like low T or high T or, you know, not really high T, but low T in men, high T in women. Um, those also, though, are going to affect our estrogen. Those also are going to affect our uh, progesterone. They're going to affect our 
LH and FSH, they're going to affect our reproductive hormones. And so thinking about testosterone as being this, you know, this almost plus minus with estrogen, that if I take synthetic testosterone, I need to either as the kind of, I guess, more bodybuilding conventional, now some TRT doctors think to block estrogen because of that, or to not block it. I think it really is this, it's this, this yin and yang, just like progesterone and estrogen in women, we have to find this balance. And when we find it, um, we, we also have to put ourselves in context. That is a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> you said um, um, synthetic testosterone. Do you mean yeah. like synthetic testosterone derivatives, like truly anabolic steroids or re just regular testosterone that men use for TRT? Yeah. So I, I should have said synthetic androgens because I think we have to look at it more of the synthetic androgen group. Um, synthetic testosterone itself is a relatively small drug classification. Synthetic androgens are bigger, um, but that we have to look at both of those and what somebody is using as well as potential other drugs that are going to influence our androgen levels and also influence our estrogen levels. Because I was always told that the that tes all testosterone mm -hmm. used for HRT or TRT mm -hmm. is considered bioidentical because the, the molecule is identical to the molecules in our body. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true, or would you say that's kind of... Mm -hmm. It depends on, it depends on some <laughs> school thought. I mean, I know one of my mentors um, who has done like extensive work on women, she's got a bit of a different definition of a bioidentical. It's um, more or less, it would be derived from a natural substance so if we think about progesterone it's say uh derived from uh, mexican yam sources um versus a synthetically created carbon copy of a hormone that exists in our body gotcha gotcha yeah okay. which is different than something like a progesterone which doesn't look like a carbon copy of ours and i think the the other thing too is is that even if something molecularly looks like something inside our body it still is a synthetically created drug at the end of the day. It's not our own. And that there is a massive world of study still to be, to be discovered on how our body actually is able to recognize these and the implications when we do take certain drugs. So as I mentioned before, like nutrient leaching. So that, I mean, that is a world still to discover. I think that there are some more, um, conservative approaches I've seen some practitioners take and kind of going like, Hey, you're on this. Let's make sure your like your inflammation is being managed. Let's take care of your blood glucose. Like let's look at all the things that could potentially be affected that are relatively benign to keep in line. And let's do that just as almost like a, a buffering. And then from there, if your estrogen, for example, is still really, really high and you're feeling like, you know, you've got all these symptoms associated with high estrogen, then maybe we do need to, to take a different approach. Yeah, I think the 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 dumbed down version of what mm -hmm. a lot of these men believe is they just say that's the you know that's the the, the female hormone. Yeah, I'm a man, and I'm you know I'm taking this and I'm taking yeah. this and training, and I'm I don't want any woman stuff in me. I want, and I think that's kind of the the, the, the mentality. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In my case, it was when I stopped blocking that yeah. stuff. Like, yeah, women hormone or not, I don't know what yeah. the hell it was, but yeah. <laughs> everything. But like the thing is, well, you it's, know. It's not a woman's hormone. It's doing 400 things inside the body. Right. That's just not attached to ovaries. That right. is just not attached to somebody's, you know, uh, uterine complex. That's a, you know, this massive reproductive organ in women. It's doing a lot of things in our bodies. And so I think it's a bit naive and almost a bit silly in 2019 to, to think of it as being the female hormone because it's far from it. That's why I don't even like to use the word reproductive hormones. Steroids are steroids. They are made in our body. There's lots of different types. These are in particular steroidal hormones and that steroidal hormones have a little bit different of a classification. And like this whole thing, I can tell you, I've just, I've done, I can't tell the results per se right now, but I did this massive systematic review. And one of the biggest challenges I had doing this was the fact there is not language across the board in, um, I mean, in academic studies, they call these things all different different things. Sometimes they're called steroids. Sometimes they're called hormones. Sometimes they're called steroidal hormones. Sometimes testosterone isn't even called testosterone. It's actually called by a almost like a number and word uh, combination because the word testosterone itself is um, came to be because of the word testy, 
which is related to men. And so that in itself, in some um, people's opinions, falsifies our understanding of what that hormone is doing inside our body. Um, so I think to think though, that people still perceive male hormones versus female hormones. Um, and that might be their motives for certain dosing or their certain kind of like drug regimes. We got to check that at the door. Cause I mean, that's just not the case at all. And we've known that since the 1930s, this is something not, it's like they put certain ideas out there and two years later, there were literally biochemists and, and um, certain endocrine scientists going like, shit, we messed up. We got to change these names. And the drug corps are going, oh, no, no, our, our products were at market. Like there's too many people. Have the labels out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. it. And so I think that, I mean, that, I mean, that speaks to why I study history is a part of my research. It's part of like, you know, clinical kind of world I'm in um, because it is so important to know that stuff. I think what you're, what you're saying about the bell curve is something that yeah. you really need to have to explore more at one point because, yeah. like I said, the, the, the vast majority of guys I'm seeing, we're just going back to the estrogen thing, is that when they yeah. start blocking it, everything just improves across the board. Yeah. But they do get, like you said, the, 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 the outliers on either end that it's like, mm -hmm. I'm doing this and it's been months and this just is not working for me. You yeah. Know, determine what is different with them. Is it going to yeah. be the whole original list you're talking about at the very beginning? Yeah, well, I think that's that there's a lot of stuff in that list that can be looked at. There's also a lot of other things, even just something like certain genetic mutations that we're still, we're starting to just tap into now of how, you know, say maybe a genetic mutation and how somebody is um, aromatizing or a certain genetic enzyme that could be deficient in how we are metabolizing estrogen, right? Estrogen can, uh, if we're not metabolizing it properly and we're not actually excreting it up our bodies, it can recirculate. Not all forms, but some forms can. Um, that's an overly simplified definition of it, but, but that if somebody say has something in this chain of command, this chain of reaction, that's a little bit off, then they're not going to have it. If you think about like a domino, um, somebody's playing like a massive thing of dominoes and they've got them all lined up and there's one little one that's kind of slightly off the track and they tip it and they've got all these things that are, you know, knocking down, knocking down, knocking down, knocking down. Oh, no. And you see that there's maybe 50 of them that have now not been knocked down because one little thing was a little hair off. That is, I mean, that's the human body for you. Uh, if there's one thing off, it's, it can really mess up, up how we are able to create, to uh, metabolize, to excrete certain hormones in our bodies. Um, and that something like, I mean, choline deficiency can cause low estrogen uh, in women. Something like... Uh, issues with B vitamins can throw off potentially um, somebody's hormones and something like not having a certain cofactor to be able to metabolize or break down your cholesterol properly can have an impact. I mean, this is the minutia, but there's a reason why I call like the human body, like I use chaos theory to discuss it because it is, it is a giant web of intermingling factors that we do not know them all. We can postulate, we can hypothesize when it is backed by enough kind of theory and clinical experience. But at the end of the day, we're still, we're still in the dark on this. We're still learning. And then the thing is, is how many people out there, how many professionals or practitioners out there just in North America alone that will know all of this stuff sufficiently? Mm -hmm. There's going to be people going to watch this video, listening to everything you're saying and saying, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so who do I call? Yeah. Where do I go to get all this <laughs> so I can figure out what's wrong with me? And I'm like, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, he's going to hate me for saying this, but Eric is a great resource to have because he is, he's, I mean, he's brilliant. Um, and people that are sometimes more in line with, I'm going to call it like the functional, reproductive, functional endocrinology, um, often they can be really great resources to have. Also working with an integrated network of practitioners. I mean, that's kind of this model of medicine that we keep trying to get out there, but still is stalling. But if you do or can get a hold of a, an integrated medical team, they are a great resource to have because at least now you might ha not have one person like Eric that knows everything. You might have a group of people that at least will work together to, to talk or to discuss. Allies are hard to find no matter what, where you are in medicine. 
um, reproduction and endocrinology, I feel that they're even harder to find just because of all these different stigmas and stereotypes and misperceptions about our, um, the different reproductive axes. Um, but I think a takeaway would be to, to take note on yourself. It sounds so simple, but it is an invaluable tool that individuals can do. So to track, I mean, for women, I, I'm such a huge advocate of tracking your menstrual cycle. For individuals I work with that are, say, going on some type of um, therapeutic program, whether that's TRT or, or something else, I say, just go get a date book, get a paper date book. Don't use your phone because if you get a new phone and you switch operating systems, you'll be hooped. Don't use an app because sometimes those can disappear. Go get a date book. And just write down each day if you change your dose, put your dose in, put how you felt that day, put certain periods of high stress. If you're somebody that you're like, hey, you know what, I eat relatively healthy all the time, I'm training, don't maybe need to mark that stuff. But if all of a sudden, like, you've gone through this cataclysmic life event, mark it down. If you're having periods of insomnia, and you're usually a really good sleeper, not like write it down, start to track these things, because you're going to be able to see patterns. It's no different than when we are doing research, whether that's quantitative or qualitative work, we are, we, we see patterns come out of our data. And that I find that personal data we can apply theories to it a lot actually more accurate than we can to apply preconceived notions and try to make ourselves fit into a box. Gotcha. It's now like, let's start to look at these different variables and then start to sort through them. As a, as a coach and as a practitioner, how do you, how do you help people just in, in point form or briefly? Right now I'm right now I'm not. Be asking you. Sorry? I said right now I'm really I'm not doing a lot of consulting work, but um when I do, I take on right now I've got a quite a hefty waiting list, but I do take on mostly women. Um I also though work with a lot of male coaches, male practitioners, male physicians, things like that, um, who are looking to kind of have what's called translational medicine. So I get to be as a researcher on the bleeding edge. Um, and a lot of times there could be upwards of, I mean, 10, 15, 25 years before that now gets put into medical practice. So people get to come to me to get information or even just, you know, they say got a clinical case and they're like, I don't know what this person is just not everything. I thought I knew this person is not, it's not working for me help. So either I'm able to connect them to other practitioners or am I able to give them some tips, tricks, tools to get them to start moving that person forward. Um, when I work with individuals, it is, I literally call myself a detective slash tutor. So I believe wholeheartedly that it's not enough just to take. It's that we have to know how. And that I'm able to give people that how. Often I'm the last person that people, like especially women, go to. They're like, I'm done. I've seen 16 endocrinologists. Nobody knows what the heck is wrong with me. Your name came up. Like, what do I do? I'm done. Like, I'm, I give up. And so um, when I work with individuals like that, it's essentially sorting through the multitude of variables that have resulted in where they currently are and being able to create some type of uh, health puzzle of sorts. So I start to put the puzzle pieces together and work with them to move forward. A lot of times it is as simple as starting with some of those lifestyle factors I mentioned at the beginning and get those in line first because maybe it's because I've been a student for 27 years now, but um, I don't like to just go get labs done first course when there are some things I can do to actually make sure those labs you get done are going to be accurate. Um, and you're not wasting your money. So that's often for me, like the first thing I work with people on other things though, for women, um, I mean, a lot of women come to me who are on oral contraceptives and they want to come off. They don't know what to do. They are scared. Um, or they've come off and now they're being diagnosed with X, Y, and Z and they don't know what to do. Um, or, um, postpartum, uh, fertility, um, or cases of, really complex like reproductive kind of dysfunction uh a lot of times i do work with athletes because that's kind of my specialty but it's not exclusive to athletes awesome 
So it was a great to having you on. This is a brilliant conversation. How would anybody uh, reach you if they wanted to reach out? Would it be through your website? or? Yeah, so it would just be through my website is the best place. Um, but I will note that I have a delay right now. I'm working. I'm trying to get a massive paper done right now. So my delay on emails is about five days right now, which is awful from a business standpoint. But it's how I can get really good research out to the world. So bear with me on that now. Uh, on my website, though, there's a catalog of every single podcast I've done. Um, there's links to different videos I've done as well, uh, different articles. And then also on my social media, I repost everything that I do. And so um, they can kind of keep up with me on on that type of thing. But there's I've done, I mean, my first podcast was, I think, three, four years ago now. And so there's a, there's a lot of different types of podcasts specifically on this type of information. Awesome. So if you guys want to stay in touch with all the, you know, the bleeding edge, cutting edge stuff that she's mm -hmm. learning and, and releasing, by all means, follow her. She's brilliant. I'm hoping that we can have her back on because now I have got like a thousand more questions for her. Um, so Victoria, that was, this was great. I hope you have to, uh, yeah, slipping on my tongue, tripping on my tongue. I hope to ha have you back on again. And uh, thanks again for, for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. All right. You have yourself a great day.